yeah, feel, please feel free to share the Facebook link as well. Um, if for the for the Facebook Live uh, session so that's going on concurrently. We just give it a minute before we we start. I think we should be seeing a few more people. Just just giving a little bit more time first, right? Yeah. Okay. Excuse me a bit of time to sort a little bit of things out. I'm trying to get a little bit of things for the new Padima bit, which I suppose can be useful. Okay. Kind of a, yeah. <sighs> Hi everyone, please give us a few more minutes. Okay, maybe we should get started um, and um, then we can always uh, catch up on some of the questions that our, our attendees have, have later on. So hello and good morning everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today at this webinar. My name is Yuran Sivaraj and I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Oncoshot Cancer Collaborative Platform. And today we have for you a webinar titled Breast Cancer Treatment and Surgery. And this webinar is co-organized by Oncoshot and the Breast Cancer Foundation as part of a series of educational webinars covering the various aspects of breast cancer management, starting from awareness about breast cancer screening and diagnosis, training and rehabilitation as well. Now the nexus of webinars is designed to equip patients as well as those who have not gotten breast cancer with knowledge on how to detect it or manage the condition with resources available in Singapore. And the details of some of these upcoming webinars will be made available via Oncoshot and the Breast Cancer Foundation over the coming weeks. So today, in today's webinar, we have with us two very esteemed breast cancer surgeons, Associate Professor Benita Tan and Assistant Professor Sim Yiro, who will be sharing valuable insights on the principles of breast cancer treatment and surgery, as well as some finer aspects and recent developments in the field of breast cancer surgery, which may not be very common knowledge to many of us. We included. We also have with us some with us Ms. Samantha from the Breast Cancer Foundation, and she's the general manager of BCF, and she'll be joining us especially during our panel Q and A session. I'd like to just introduce our first speaker for today, which is uh, Assistant Professor Sim Yurong. So Yurong, Dr. Yurong, graduated with a medical degree and PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2009, obtained a fellowship at the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. Her focus and interests are in breast cancer research and education, and she's currently a consultant at the Division of Surgical Oncology at the National Cancer Center, Singapore. Dr. Sim will be presenting on the topic of general insights on breast cancer surgery. Dr. Sim, over to you. Dr. Sim, I think you're muted. Sorry. Okay. All right. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you to everyone. Thank you to Oncoshot and uh, Breast Cancer Foundation for giving me this chance to share with you some general insights on breast cancer surgery. So just to introduce, um, breast cancer is the number one cancer amongst women and among Singaporean women. And unfortunately, this incidence is increasing 
as you can see over the years, the number of women getting breast cancer is rapidly increasing. And actually, the incidence has tripled in the last 50 years. And it can occur in any woman. So this graph shows you the one in the bold red, the number of invasive cancers, breast cancers, and dotted one is the inside two or the stage zero, very early cancers. And both are increasing over the years. And in this next graph, you can also see that uh, any, can occur in any woman and above the age of 40, the risk of you getting it is much higher and increased. So some basic principles of breast cancer surgery that I will touch on during this morning's talk. Why does one get breast cancer? How can we prevent cancer? So briefly, prophylaxis, screening, and how do we diagnose breast cancer? Some basic principles of the surgeries that we can do, but I won't go into too much detail, so that's what uh, uh, after that, Professor Benita Tan will go into more details and share about some exciting advancements in breast cancer surgeries. And just briefly talk a bit about adjuvant therapies, that is the other treatments that we can give in addition to surgery. And how do we do surveillance? So why does one get cancer? Cancer arises from our own cells. And as we let our cells grow and reproduce, um, sometimes along the way, the genetic defects happen. And if the body is unable to repair them, these cells grow and spread in an uncontrolled fashion, forming tumors, cancers. And when they escape the immune surveillance, they just grow bigger and bigger. And that's when we detect them as cancers. And all this is contributed by two main factors, us living longer and us having lots of uh, lifestyle changes. And also, um, part of living longer, most of the increasing number of us inherit genetic predispositions like the BRCA1 and 2 gene, which increases your risk of breast cancer. So, how do we prevent cancer? Prophylaxis. One method is to try to remove the, the, the organ at risk, which is the breast, before cancer has even started. And this may seem a very extreme um, approach, but this is a method that we um, encourage for women um, who are at high risk, such as those who, uh, who carry the genetic mutation. And uh, celebrity Angelina Jolie is one example that highlighted the, the choice and the, the, um, the use of prophylactic mastectomies to remove the breast even before the chance of uh, breast cancer forming. But um, another way to reduce the risk of breast cancer is to reduce the known risks that we know are involved. So there are some things that we cannot change, just like being female, growing older. But there are things that we can change, such as not smoking, limiting alcohol intake, having a healthier lifestyle and diet, having optimum body weight, and um, reducing the use of hormonal medications, and try to breastfeed our children if possible. And... Uh, so we try not to increase the risk of breast cancer and reduce it if we can. And also, most importantly, is to start screening early. So why is it important to screen early? Screening early is what we want to pick up cancers even before they can be they cause any symptoms or can be detected. Um, and we want to pick them early before they can even spread. That is uh, before they metastasize, before they, they acquire more genetic mutations and form resistance to chemotherapy. And the smaller the tumor, the better, the easier the treatment is to reduce the bulk so that our immune system can manage. And the earlier breast cancer is detected and treated, the better the overall survival. So this is an old graph showing that the, uh, on the left, being zero and one being the lowest stage of breast cancer, and on towards the right, three and four are the highest stages. And you can see the earlier we pick them up, the higher the survival rate. Uh, for breast cancer survival, so it's almost close to 100%, more than 90%. So how do we screen for breast cancer? The most uh, common screening tools are mammograms. So it is a low-dose radiation x-ray. It takes about 30 minutes to complete. It can be uncomfortable for some women or most women, and all depends on your age, shape, and size. Um, and the most important thing, it can help identify cancers even before they can be felt, before they present as a lump. So where can we get our screening mammograms? We are fortunate in Singapore, we have a Screen for Life program where up to 19 um, centers all scattered around Singapore where you can book, have subsidized, uh, affordable subsidized uh, mammograms. They're easy to book, uh, convenient locations all around Singapore. And it's a consultant-based program where you get these double reading of the mammogram uh, images. And uh, there are a lot of 
uh, Medisafe and uh, um, uh, subsidies available for everybody. And uh, depending on the time of the year, sometimes you can even get discounts when it's closer to Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So when should we do our screening mammogram? If, uh, if from 40 to 49, we were encouraged to have it once a year and 50 and above once every two years for your mammogram. But more importantly, it's also good to continue to examine yourself regularly to look out for any symptoms of breast cancer, which I'll touch upon later. And how can we go about making our screen mammogram? It's very easy. You can phone any of the polyclinics, or even better now, you can scan a QR code and book a mammogram appointment online. Okay, so how do we go about diagnosing breast cancer? We examine the patient, we do radiological imaging, and we take the histology. Um, some symptoms of breast cancer when they present, um, you, the most commonly is a breast lump. Sometimes it can present as redness of the skin or dimpling or an ulcer or swelling of the skin like a pole the orange, like an orange skin. And when you have changes in the nipple, be it in retraction, a rash or bleed, please consult and seek medical advice as soon as possible. But most, uh, but most case breast cancer lump usually presents a painless lump and the patient and the lady can feel perfectly fine until it, it goes uh, really, really big. So early detection is good. So common imaging tools we have is mammography, as I mentioned. Um, and when uh, we detect something, we usually complement it with an ultrasound. And in selected cases, we also do MRI of the breast. When we see an area of suspicion, then we will need to get some tissue for diagnosis. And usually it uh, involves a needle biopsy of various sorts, either a simple needle aspiration for lymph nodes usually, or a core biopsy where we just take out a, a core of the tissue and get it tested. Sometimes the tumor may be too small and we can do a vacuum-assisted core needle biopsy where it involves cutting and sucking out the whole lump to send it for testing. And sometimes when biopsies are not technically not possible, um, and then because we're detecting smaller and smaller lumps, uh, lesions, so we can even do a surgery to put a little wire in to find the area and we excise it. And this technique is not just only diagnostic, but sometimes we use it for um, therapeutic uh, purposes, like removing the cancer if it's detected very early and at a very small stage. So surgery, the main aim of surgery is to remove the cells with the principle that once the cells are cancerous cells are removed, we've killed it. We want to remove it with good margins and we need to address any uh, lymphatics, the lymph nodes that if the cancer has spread to. And all this to remove the tumor load in the body so that uh, we can give other non-surgical therapies to help eliminate any microscopic disease that may be present. Some basic principle, some basic uh, surgical options we have are mastectomy and breast conserving surgery. So the most traditional form of surgery for the breast um, is a mastectomy, which is removing of the breast and addressing the lymph nodes, and the lady is left with a flat chest. But this doesn't always have to happen. Okay, uh, we doesn't mean that the, the breast cancer survival has to live with a flat chest. We have options of reconstructions, so we can re keep the skin and recreate a new breast, or we can, in certain selected cases, keep the nipple and recreate a new breast too. There are many uh, options in which we can fill up the, to make a new breast. We can borrow some flat skin flap, a fat flap from other parts of the body, like the lat dorsi flap, the tummy fat, and uh, this is also quite nice because it doubles up as a tummy tuck for the ladies, and uh, or we can use implants. And, uh, and as we are picking up tumors smaller and smaller, uh, we can, we are actually trying to move away from mastectomies and trying to do breast conservation surgeries. So that's like a lumpectomy where we only remove a small lump of tumor and as well as test the lymph nodes. And many trials have shown that the overall and disease-free survival is the same, whether we remove the whole breast or we just remove the lump and conserve the breast, but that has to be coupled with radiotherapy. Um, I mentioned about the lymph node um, testing. So normally for early breast cancer, we will test the first few lymph nodes in young kids to check if there is um, any cancer spread. And uh, if, we, if there are no cancerous cells in it, we can avoid an axillary clearance, which is to remove all the lymph nodes in the, the uh, armpit area. And, um, and some examples of which how we find these lymph nodes in the armpit, we can use various sorts of dyes. We can use a radioactive uh, tracer. We 
can use a blue dye to find the notes, so the notes will turn up blue in the axilla. And uh, there are later advancements, we even use magnetic traces, and there are many other traces that we can use these days. Um, all these are to help reduce uh, the scale of surgery, so that uh, to reduce the morbidity of our surgeries and give the patient a better quality of life. And the management of breast cancer is not just only by the surgeons, but it's a multidisciplinary, multimodal discipline. We, do, we work as a big team together, the surgeons, with the medical oncologist to give chemo for selected patients, radiotherapy for selected patients, hormonal therapy as well for selected patients. And with advancement and research, when we find out more and more specific targets that we can identify in breast cancer patients and breast cancer cells, we can also give targeted therapy for selected patients. We usually, the management of breast cancer is usually discussed in our tumor boards where all the specialists are involved to give the best personalized care for our patients. So just, um, just a brief talk about a few, two adjuvant therapies, mainly because of the advancements of what we have. So most of the time, chemotherapy is usually given after the surgery. However, in selected cases, we can give chemotherapy before the surgery. That's what we call new adjuvant chemotherapy. And then generally for the locally advanced cancers, the big cancers, and we can help shrink them down to convert them from a non-operable case to an operable one, or from one that we cannot conserve the breast because the tumor is too big, to one that can be small enough to conserve the breast. Um, also, with uh, briefly about radiotherapy, it is usually given after surgery over a range of four to six weeks. Um, and um, but then now with also advancement, we can give. So this is an example of a uh, radiotherapy after surgery with external beam. And now with advancement, we can select the patients. If the tumor is small enough, we can also give intraoperative radiotherapy, and uh, and this is the one-time radiotherapy and saves the patient a lot of uh, the weeks of radiotherapy after the surgery. So you can see all these options are, um, are good and are, uh, available, especially, and, uh, especially if you can pick up cancers early enough and you have more options. And um, although most uh, breast cancers are curable, uh, especially if they're picked up early enough, it is still important to continue follow up with your doctors and continue yearly screening and examination because we are all still at risk of a second cancer or a recurrence. So to sum up, the earlier we detect breast cancer, the earlier we treat them, the better the overall survival. And as you can see on the graph on the right, the, the over time, actually the survival rate for breast cancer is improving. And that's probably due to early detection, um, most uh, uh, awareness of most of us picking up early, and also advancement in our adjuvant therapies, like chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, radiotherapy, and improvement in surgery too. So... Cancer is a word, not a death sentence. And uh, I thank you for your time. And I will pass it on to Professor Bonita for more exciting advancements in the types of surgeries we have. Thank you. Thank you, Yurong. Um, so that was a great introduction to you know, breast cancer um, surgery, as well as how you know, surgery is actually a very critical, probably the most critical point of helping a patient towards cure. And um, we also had a lot of insight into how you know, diagnosis was being made, um, the different modalities for diagnosis. And that was all very helpful for us. Thank you so much for that. I'd like to now introduce our next speaker. So we have with us also Associate Professor uh, Benita Tan. Professor Benita Tan obtained her Master's of Medicine in Surgery from the National University of Singapore and a fellowship with the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. Um, before completing a Doctor of Philosophy at the Sauswick Hawk School of Public Health in NUS. As a senior consultant, general surgeon who sub-specializes in breast cancer surgery, she has experience in a wide range of breast cancer procedures. She performs breast biopsies, including vacuum-assisted biopsies and surgeries such as skin sparing and nipple sparing surgery for breast reconstruction. So Professor Benita will today be presenting on the topic of advances in breast cancer surgery, including new techniques in breast reconstruction. So without any further delay, I'd like to just invite Dr. Benita to actually give us this presentation. Thank you, Prof. Hi, hi, thanks, Huren, uh, for the kind invitation, and thank you, Breast Cancer Foundation, as well. I mean, Huren, you are too modest. I think the, the, our successes is because we have got a great team, including medical oncologists and everyone else, so it's not just the work of surgeons alone. So, so that's something that we need to really emphasize and share. 
So bear with me for a little while, I share this uh, little bit of information in terms of advancements that we can have for our ladies today. Let me see the slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what kind of advancements uh, we have in the recent decade or so. So the common questions our patients will ask when they're on the diagnosis is how long will I live with this cancer? Will I live with this cancer? Will I lose my breast? And what my choices of surgery are? So in the range of this couple of slides we're going to go on, we'll tackle some of these common questions and how some of these have changed uh, over the years. So really the advancements uh, is in various aspects, not just in surgical techniques, but the aims of surgery these days have changed somewhat. And of course, as I mentioned, you know, the, this, this teamwork we have with our fellow colleagues in terms of, especially in medical oncology, there have been new medicines available and how we coordinate the changes in treatment that makes the difference today. So it's not just techniques, but really how we do things differently today. Okay, so with the same question that we have and how will I live with this cancer, as Yung has shared with us, we know that you know, the cancer can occur in any age group, uh, although more common in the older, and life expectancy is better and there are a lot of survivors with us today uh, with breast cancer. So actually many survivors can live a normal and healthy life without cancer. So how does this impact uh, in terms of how our ladies will live? Uh, most of my patients tell us that the most difficult part of the journey when they are on treatment is actually chemotherapy because they feel tired, they feel sick. But once they have recovered from the chemotherapy, some of these scars of surgery will really stay because if the surgery scar is something that doesn't change over time, unlike the memories of chemotherapy, that they'll be reminded of that every day. So in the past, uh, you know, where, where very dramatic radical surgery is done and patients always will lose the breast, then they will always be remembered or, or they will always remember this scar of the surgery and they never return to normal. And where there are techniques not of the past where there's no further improvement in terms of emphasis on how the patient will feel and cause species, then even if you keep the breast, a lot of ladies will always be remembered every time they look into the mirror that they are not quite the same person they used to be. So our aims of surgery today, apart from aiming to cure the cancer and prolong life, there's a lot of emphasis that we need to improve the quality of life for our ladies with cancer or without cancer. And that is with improvement of better surgical options and surgical techniques. So as Dr. Yong has mentioned, mastectomy is not the only option for ladies today. Uh, there is a good option, there's a good chance for many ladies today to keep the breast. So what do we know about the advances in surgical technique? So what I'm going to talk about next is really the breast conserving options. They are a little bit different as they've been improved. I uh, mentioned a little bit on the breast reconstruction and dif slight differences in techniques, although Dr. Sim has already mentioned most of the, the reconstruction uh, aspects as well. And really, really what we try to do these days is really to try to reduce uh, the deformity and the scars of surgery that our ladies may end up with if this is not nicely done. So the concepts of breast conserving surgery is really to remove the cancer with a margin of tissue around it to make sure that we aim is to remove the cancer completely and preferably just one surgery rather than multiple surgeries. So compared in the past where we showed the pictures, you know, now we improve in terms of the techniques by placing better places for where the scar is. We try to hide the scar as much as we can, for example, around the nipple area, right, in the lower part of the breast or at the side towards the armpit area. And this is really dependent on where the cancer is. The, the aspect then is to avoid having a big scar or scar over the breast where deformities uh, will appear. So better scar placement, placement is one of the simple techniques that we can use. For ladies where the, the tumour is a little bit bigger, nowadays you may have heard of the term oncoplastic uh, surgery. Essentially, the basic concepts of uh, removing cancer is the same. The principle holds, we aim to remove all the cancer completely. But we try to put into play a little bit of plastic surgery techniques, right? The aim is to basically prevent the deformity. So we put together a combination of these techniques to make the surgery outcomes better. So for example, on this slide in pictorial, there are some of these te techniques that we use. But essentially, we want to reshape the breast by placing the scar better so that after surgery, we do not end with a breast that's deformed or out of shape compared to the normal side. 
So these are some of the, the, the techniques, for example, doing a surgery around the nipple area. The one on the right, in terms of what we call a melon slice, which I'll show with an example later. Others, for example, ladies with a larger breast, we can sometimes make the breast a little bit smaller, which I'll show with an example later on as well. At the same time, sometimes when the tumour is much bigger, let's say the tumour is about 15-20% uh, volume of the breast, and the lady is not keen to have uh, mastectomy, then one of the things we can do is try to put in tissue, that means a partial flap, that means we try to get the, tish the tissue from the patient's uh, surrounding area, like the side or the bottom part of the breast, to fill in that space, okay? I will be able to show an example of one lady uh, later on as well to show how this technique works. But essentially, we are trying to put back in the tissue from the nearby area to prevent a volume loss. So these are again newer techniques uh, that we can help ladies keep their breast. So for example, this one, right? If we have removed the tumour in the upper outer quadrant of the breast without doing anything in particular, then the, the deformity that you will see in the scar, you will get will appear something like this. So similarly, another one example, if the tumour is at the bottom of the breast, and if I remove the tumour without doing anything else, the breast will sink in like this, and in, in the past, it will look like a bird beak appearance, and that deformity, it's not very pleasant. So back to the questions, will I always lose my breast? As I've mentioned before, no. In these days, the aim is really to maintain the quality of life. Dr. Sim also shared very clearly, we know that the long-term survival, whether you choose to keep the breast or you choose to remove the breast, as long as it can be done, is the same as long as we complete the treatment. So if you look at uh, in Singapore, in Singapore, mastectomy is still quite common, but if you look at it in the West, uh, in Europe, or even our nearby neighbours like in Japan and in Korea, breast conserving surgery is the most common operation compared to mastectomy. So as I mentioned, not everybody can manage a mastectomy very well, but I, I'm pleased to say that a lot of our Singaporean women are really very brave. They are really very stoic and they manage their condition very well. And I suppose it's a priority difference. So yes, some of our, many of our ladies do manage very well with the mastectomy, but not everybody does so. So the point for us to share this information is really to also let everyone know that there are options. It's not always a mastectomy. Okay, it's not the only good option that you can choose uh, if, as long as, as it is suitable where the majority of our ladies are suitable for conservation. Uh, also mentioned by Dr. Sim earlier, some ladies have no choice. So for example, if the tumour is very large or the tumours are what we call multi-centric, that means there are multiple tumours in the same breast where the breast is not safe to be kept, then the mastectomy would be recommended as the best option. But not all ladies need to be flat after surgery. Breast reconstruction is a, a really possibility and it's, it's increasing these days, mainly because we work very, very well with our plastic surgeons and techniques have improved tremendously over the past 20 years. So using tissue from the back with or without an implant or using the abdominal flap and it's the additional bits we have in our tummy. So as Dr. Sim says, it's a return of a, a side benefit, it's a little bit of a tummy tuck to use the tissue from the tummy to the breast. Uh, or the use of implants. So um, Angelina Jolie reconstructed her breast using breast uh, silicone implants. So these are something that uh, we actually can do. But what has changed uh, in terms of the advancements in techniques? So, so in the past, it was always taking the nipple together with the reconstruction. But in the recent years, we have understood the concept and we are keeping more and more nipples for the patient so they look more natural. Uh, they do not need to be removed. So nipple sparing is a newer technique in the more recent years. Also, what I tell my patients often is that when we do a breast reconstruction, in the past, uh, you know, when you reconstructed the breast, you try to do the best that you can and not everybody will have the so-called the best shape intent uh, after they heal. But now we do a lot more what we call re-sculpturing in terms of doing uh, liposuction and fat grafting kind of shape where there's a little bit of a hollow or sometimes where there's a little bit more tissue that you know we want to adjust uh, these techniques are done with our plastic surgeons. So optimizing and so-called nip and tucks to this sculpture to improve the outcomes is something that's also available and, and fairly widely used these days compared to what we had in the past. What about opposite breast surgery? So some ladies have got uh, breast reconstruction for uh, mastectomy for one side of the breast. 
And sometimes the, the other side of the breast may be very, very large and very long, or what we call too thick. And, and therefore, there's a bit of a mismatch. So sometimes opposite breast surgery can be considered in terms of reducing the breast. Or ladies, for example, who, who wish to upsize. There are ladies who wish to upsize, meaning they know their breast has been small and now they have cancer surgery and they're going to have surgery anyway. They have a choice to make it a little bit more, a little bit larger, whether with implants or own tissue. So sometimes augmentation can be considered at the same time and it does help the patient in terms of overall recovery. Our uh, incision placing, that means where we place incisions has changed as well. We try to go as, as little a, a, away from the nipple area and also the aim is also to try to keep the nipple. So some of these techniques has evolved as we go along. But most of this is also dependent on where the patient's uh, breast volume, breast shape, uh, where the tumour is for the best outcome. So these are just some pictures of patients uh, that the uh, rather illustration of some patients who had uh, breast reconstruction. So these two patients had a uh, full breast removed and they had a, what we call a DEP flap, that is a free flap where there's microsurgery. So this lady on the top, on the left, you see uh, the breast uh, image uh, before surgery. And after surgery with the full breast reconstruction, she maintained the same shape. Uh, the volume is a little bit slightly less but the symmetry is generally still very good and she's very, very balanced. The lady below also had similar surgery. And in, in her case, the surgery was on the right side, this one. Uh, there's a slight volume difference, but in a bra, she's quite comfortable and she's quite happy. And this lady, I've treated her now, she must be about eight years post-treatment. Another example, this is using a flap or tissue flap from the thigh. In the past, it was only using the back or the abdomen. The abdomen is still the most commonly used because ladies tend to have extra in the abdomen to use. But some ladies, for example, if they've got multiple surgeries in the abdomen, nowadays we can use uh, tissue from the thigh. This particular lady had surgery on the left side. The, the left uh, big illustration is the shape of the breast before surgery. And the illustration on the right is the uh, image of her with the flap in after the surgery. So in her case, she had the incision or the cuts in the bottom part of the breast, which is not above the breast, which is quite well hidden. There are other examples. So implants can be used. So these two ladies had surgery on the left side, uh, which uh, the reconstruction was done with implants. So depending on the shape of the patient and the volume of the breast, the choice of the uh, reconstruction will adjust accordingly, as well as based on the patient's uh, preferences. But implants can work very, very well as well. Of course, the newer technique these days, we have, we have heard of robotic surgery in a lot of areas of surgery. Uh, and, and breast surgery is similar. Although we have not taken on robotic surgery in a big way, we have taken on keyhole surgery, that means endoscopic surgery. So this is one of my colleagues in Sengkang, uh, just illustration of her doing the endoscopic uh, mastectomy. Uh, and this particular lady, um, she could keep the nipple and uh, actually you look at the slide on the illustration on the right. Her surgical scar is actually at the side uh, of the body, at the side of the breast. And when she wears a bra over, actually it's completely hidden. And this is her after surgery. Uh, you would not have known that she would have had the whole breast removed by, by just looking at her. So these are how things we have improved uh, in our techniques to allow our ladies to be to go back to as much of as normal as possible so they actually they as much as we can manage of course the reconstructed breast after surgery does not is not the real thing right it, it doesn't feel the same uh, the, the touch and the sensation is less but at least we try to maintain a balance for our ladies to make them as whole as we can possibly be so that they can forget about the trauma of the cancer treatment and cancer surgery in the many many years to come because we really want them to go back to the community, we really want them to live a normal life. So what are my choices? So I've gone through the different, uh, in terms of the different techniques that we can use. So it's important, as I mentioned, it really depends on the interplay of many factors, uh, the stage and the type of cancer, the shape and the volume of the breast, where the cancer is, and the individual patient's health, the patient's characteristics, and of course, the patient's preference. Uh, for the surgeon, we are like an artist, it's a, us is a sculptor. But as I mentioned to you, Ren, <laughs> you are very important. We do very well because we've got excellent colleagues and work as a great team. So this is the part that's very, very important in terms of how we treat. The success is because we have a great teamwork. 
and we work with the medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, our therapists, our, our, our social workers, our occupational therapists, as well as our volunteers with BCF. Right? All these individuals form part of the team to make this journey a success. Very important not to forget also is that research and clinical trials are critical. The, re the reason why we have a lot of these improvements is because now with research, we understand a lot more about the biology of the cancer and how patients will respond to treatment. We have new discovery of new drugs that's coming out. And then of course, the most successful is the targeted therapy for the HER2 gene, uh, uh, for the HER2 positive tumors. And these make a big difference in the things that we can do for our patients because we know the cancers better. And of course, chemotherapy regime has really changed. So as I mentioned, it's really how we treat the, the same condition over the years that's advanced. In the past, it's usually surgery first, no matter how large the cancer is, then we go for systemic treatment with chemo and targeted radiotherapy, hormonal therapy. But these days, in high-risk tumours and tumours that are suitable and respond well to chemotherapy and targeted therapy, this is the first uh, recommendation I would recommend. Uh, uh, sounds a bit odd for some uh, patients to ask, right? I mean, I'm a surgeon, why do I not operate straight away and why do I do send to somebody else to do the treatment? But this is an important concept because I, I think the, we need to recognise and we need to realise that the overall outcome can be a lot better. If you do do a simple switch and swap the orientation or rather the order of treatment. So AIM really is early systemic treatment that means early chemotherapy if chemotherapy is required and it does help with the surgery because some of these tumours will respond very very well to, surge, uh, to the systemic treatment and if they get smaller in size then the amount of breast tissue I need to take out during surgery can be reduced and you know that if I can take less that will cause less deformity and the long-term outcome in terms of the aesthetics and shape of the breast will be better. So how do this all come to them together? So clearly these are really individualized for everyone, it will be different. So each patient will have a different plan depending on all the factors I've described. So I'll show you a couple of examples. So this is Madam A, she's a 74 year old lady. She went for health screening, right? She's very fit, independent. She goes about doing the own things by herself. So on, on screening, she discovered a small little lump, right? It was not felt. So it's really a small tumour. So when she came to cancer centre, we saw this tumour that's uh, very small. We did a needle biopsy. And then uh, this was proven to be a breast cancer, right? And, and it was a so-called a good biology breast cancer. So as Dr. Sim also mentioned, you know, for those people who are suitable, then we have newer techniques like intraoperative radiotherapy at the point of surgery. So really, she had that uh, 24 minutes of radiotherapy during that surgery for the small tumor, and after which, when we saw the results, but she didn't need not any. She did not have any more need for further radiotherapy, and all she needed was tablets. So she was home within 24 hours and prescribed uh, for follow up for five years for hormonal therapy. So this is also a key point because you also mentioned the importance. This is only possible because she was proactive, she came forward, she went for screening, a small cancer was detected. And we can use these new techniques to allow her to get treated and get cured for the cancer with minimal changes and, and sort of short term and treatment with lower, less side effects. This example of Miss B, she's uh, early 50s, a uh, busy lady. She has a large tumor that uh, she didn't come forth until quite a bit later. So she came to us with this stage three tumor with a large breast mass. So we did the workup for her, we biopsied, this is what we call a HER2 positive tumor. And on the left, you see on the MRI, this is an MRI image. So you see here on this screen, this white lump here is actually the cancer. So we recommended that she has got chemotherapy and targeted therapy for the tumor. And after the chemotherapy, you look at this MRI on the right, the tumor mass can no longer be seen on the MRI. So she's an excellent responder. This was also done, and she, she also really wanted uh, to keep the breast. She was not keen for a mastectomy. So we, we counseled her and tell, told her that, yes, we will try. We need to see her respond to systemic therapy. And if she responded very well, we might be able to be successful in keeping her breast. So in her case, what we, the technique we use is what we call a melon slice. So essentially the tumour is around the central 
uh, block of this red box. Okay. And at the point of surgery, we remove the large area in the center as seen by this X-ray of the specimen. And then after we brought back the breast together and closed. So post-operative, she looks like this. So the breast shape is still there. Of course, you cannot get away with the fact that the breast will be smaller because we removed a substantial amount of uh, breast tissue from her. But she maintained a good form. When she wears, a, wears her bra, you can't tell the difference and the volume difference is not very large for her to feel a big difference. But that's the outcome that we can get. So of course, post-surgery, we're all very eager to see the results and clearly she's responded two things. She responded ex very, very well. There was almost no cancer left in the breast as one. Two, of course, we got clear margins mainly because the treatment response was excellent. So this is the outcome we always hope to have when patients come to us with a large tumour. But of course, in the first instance, I would rather patients don't come to us with a large tumour and have that treated uh, as, as, with a little, as little treatment as possible for the best outcome. This is another lady we had a little bit uh, also with a large tumour. Uh, a little bit different from Madam uh, Ms. B. This lady had quite large volume breasts and it's quite totic, totic meaning the breast is a little bit long and she's been troubled by the weight of the breast and she gets a bit of discomfort and back in. When we investigated her and scanned her, her tumour was almost 7 centimetres. In this lady, she was also not keen, she was really, really wanting us to try to keep her breast. If this, if she presented 10 years ago, right, you almost need no choice. Everybody will recommend a full breast removal with no other options available. But these days, it is different. I think you can really try. You can really look at it to see how best we can give the treatment to allow them to respond, uh, to allow them to be able to keep the breast and not have a mastectomy. So again, you look at the, on the two scans on the left. Uh, this white area is where the tumour is. You can see on the lower side, this white area where the tumour is. After we, given, we gave the chemotherapy, uh, the white area is much less. Right? Compared to Miss B, it didn't respond as well. But maybe this, but this is because of the tumour type that she has. But there is a reduction. The, the tumour did get smaller. So this is, this is also good response. So this uh, uh, illustrations, uh, pictorials of her before surgery. So when I did the planning, you look at the top of this circle, I estimated the area that needed to be removed was quite large. Right? Uh, if I have removed it just like this and without doing anything else in particular, you can imagine the big volume loss and the complete out of shape the breast would go. So in this uh, particular lady, we worked with a plastic surgeon and we used what I call the reduction technique. So this was the volume of tissue I took up to the edge. This is also a bit larger based on the planning of the surgery that she wanted to have, but it's really a large area of the tissue. Almost 10 centimeters across and almost 200 grams. And this is her after the surgery. So our plan with the plastic surgeon was to do what she hoped to be able to do, was also to reduce the size of the breast because of the weight she was carrying. So she did an opposite breast reduction, that means reduce the breast volume and length of, of the opposite side, which is the right side. The cancer is on the left side. So this is her about five months after surgery. Uh, the breast volume shape is very good. It's much shorter than it was before. And it decreased a significant amount of weight that she has that her shoulders had to bear. So this is how we interplay really in the advances of making use of the plastics technique mixed and work together with the oncology, that means surgery, cancer surgery techniques to give our patients a better outcome. There were some questions also earlier from we see from the, the, our audience on lymphedema. There are also, also some improvements or advances in surgery for lymphedema as a result of breast cancer. So not really breast cancer surgery, but it is also advancements related to care of ladies with breast cancer. So, the key point before I go into the techniques is really lymphedema aims is largely we want to be able to prevent uh, the occurrence of lymphedema whenever we possibly can. We know that our ladies with uh, axillary surgery have a chance of maybe about 15% of getting arm swelling with this lymphedema. But if we can take care of ourselves better to prevent injuries, uh, the rates could be reduced. But when it comes to lymphedema already present, then uh, treatment will will definitely be one mainstay will be occupational therapy with 
uh, massage as well as uh, uh, compression bandage. Right, so these are just some of the illustrations that we have for our patients on what are techniques of massage and the multi step that we teach. But when it comes to surgery, if it's not too delayed, right, we generally recommend and recognize patients with lymphedema to come forward earlier. And if we identify that that's lymphedema, we'll send to our plastic surgery team that we have working together with our occupational therapy and the breast surgeon and our breast care nurses to try to optimize their massage and uh, a non-surgical treatment and then look into how successful they could be with the surgery. So these days, we have two operations that can improve uh, lymphedema. One of them is a bypass, that means we join the lymphatic uh, vessels to the vein to allow the fluid flow back into the system through the veins. The other technique is to do a lymph node transplant so what we do, we get lymph nodes from other places in the body and put it into the arm area. And the concept of this that it does is that it creates new uh, lymphatic channels to improve the flow of the lymphatic fluid and therefore reduce uh, the lymphedema. Okay, so looking forward, I think uh, the message for everyone is we, we need to look after ourselves well. Some of us will be at risk of developing cancer in our lifetime, so we really need to look after ourselves. We remember to, to, to remind ourselves, we need to empower ourselves with all this knowledge so that we don't need to look out and we can look out for not only ourselves, but our loved ones. So think of the important things we need to look at, as Dr. Singh mentioned, right? So sometimes we, we go for our hairdo, we treat our pimples and then we manage our weights, but we forget to look at our health. So I love these slides a lot. These are from uh, Breast Cancer Foundation uh, uh, that was produced, I think, about 10 years ago. And it sends very, very important messages that we need to have. And of course, uh, this year in our Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October, I think we need to remind ourselves. So with the one of our messages this year was what we can do for ourselves, right? Exercise is very important. So exercise can reduce our risk for breast cancer. So these are the things that we can do. Okay, and as Dr. Sim already mentioned, please those who have, of you who have not gone for your screening, if you're of age, please do. It does help you. It helps everyone uh, to do well and do better. Okay, so the QR code you can use is now readily available in most places, uh, or you can go directly through the link. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Benita. That was um, very, very insightful. I there was, there was one comment that you made that uh, you know I thought I should add to that. You said that breast cancer surgeons you're like artists and doing a sculpture, but you know, from your slides, um, one thing that we can all take back is there's so many factors that need to be considered in terms of how, you know, you approach a breast cancer patient, the decision making, um, you know, uh, factors that play into what kind of surgery they go for, and also how do you reconstruct them, um, or offer options of reconstruction, and that's where really there's so much science and uh, logic and considerations that has to go in, um, that it's such a complex decision making process. And I hope that our, our patients as well, when they look at all this, you know, they, they understand that um, you know, when they're, they're receiving care, it's, it's going to be something that um, they want to be part of a team that has managed um, such complex conditions in a multidisciplinary setting, um, because it's, it's just not something that, you know, a simple decision like you have to go for surgery, Will, will resolve yeah. and um, and I think that's 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 something that was very very clear for all of us you know um, listening to your presentation so thank you so much for that yeah so I'm not to add to that we, we like to think ourselves as sculptures and artists if in the past we are only destructors because in the past the only thing we do was to remove the whole breast and that was the most common uh, presently it's still the most common procedure but we hope not to be able we hope not to keep doing that in the long run because our ladies are really surviving very very long and, and they're really living a normal life and you know if the outcome is going to be the same we, we want to do better we want to do better for the ladies around us and, and then that, i think that's a very important message that we need to share absolutely because it's not just also about you know the curing the cancer but also about maintaining excellent psychological and emotional health yes. over the rest of their lifetimes Definitely. and i think this is this is where there's so much wonderful emphasis on as well so thank you so much um, as we kind of alluded to, you know, making decisions about surgery and the impact on the emotional and psychological level can actually be a great 
factor or burden that uh, many patients may have to undergo. And I think this is where it's very important for our patients and also the community of doctors to be fully aware of what kind of options and services we actually have in the community to support our patients in that journey. Because that journey is not just something over a period of short months where they get their treatment, but it actually extends way past that as well. And in this regard, I want to actually introduce uh, Samantha. Samantha is a close friend of Uncle Short. We've worked together at Samantha and BCF for some time. And we'd like to just um, call upon Samantha to kind of keep us updated on you know, what's been happening with BCF and the services that might really be helpful for a lot of our patients. Thank you, Samantha. Okay, good morning, everyone. And thank you for spending Saturday morning with us. I know it's a pretty busy time and I know Christmas is around the corner, but we're so thankful that you're able to just spend some time that you can educate and empower your loved ones with the education that what uh, Dr. Benita Tan was talking about. I just wanted to share with you just what have we been doing and what do we, why do we do what we do? So I'm just gonna, it's just gonna be a short uh, presentation. Let me just try and uh, get myself organized here. Okay, so hang on. Okay, so just wanted to share with you what, what do we do in Breast Cancer Foundation? And it's actually these women warriors. You see all these beautiful women? Like what the, the, uh, Dr. Sim Yurong, Dr. Benita Tan, and Dr. Huron has said. This is what we do. We, we are here to basically support our women warriors. They've been through a lot. And we don't call them survivors. We call them warriors because they've gone through so much. And it's not only that. We are here on a mission to help the community, to strengthen the community, and not only for the women warriors, but for their caregivers. Because like I said, it takes many hands for this journey to begin. We have our medical support. At the, at the home front, they actually, the caregivers also need that support as well as the men. The men are so important. So we, we do have this as a support network. What do we do? We're here for the psychosocial support for the community. As you know, it is a very long, it is a long journey that medical advances has done such that our survivors and our warriors are definitely exceeding the five-year mark. So that's the great thing. But then how do we then continue to support and empower the community to make sure that they are fully equipped? Here, we do have befriending services. This is really important, the emotional befriending. This, we do have volunteer befrienders that are matched to the specific type of cancer that you have. And these are women and caregivers who've gone through that journey. So there is a one-for-one -one matching. And at this point in time, normally it is very high touch. We, our volunteer befrienders go down and visit the, the um, survivor or the caregiver, but because of the current safe measurement uh, measures, we actually do it um, by teleconferencing or through the phone. Okay, so we do provide that emotional support. And, and it's just that sometimes the patient gets up at 3 a.m. and says, how do I solve this problem? Because I can't sleep and I've got this question. So we actually have this available. It's a one-to-one -one, uh, bespoke uh, volunteer befriending service that we have and these women have gone through that uh, journey as well as the caregivers so that is one of our key pillars of support that we can help the doctors to because i don't think the doctors want to wake up at 3 a.m in the morning to to counsel their patient you know so we try to help on the other part the psychosocial part the second thing is that we do have uh, a support group We've moved on to the online platform and we actually introduced, we have the caregivers support group, we have English, Mandarin. We also have one uh, care uh, support group specifically for young women, less than the age of 45, because their questions and their needs are very, very different from somebody who has been diagnosed with breast cancer at 74 or 50 years and above. So they have different needs. So this is actually an online support group where they can come and they can share. It's a safe space. And for those who have just been recently diagnosed, they can keep their privacy because they switch their cameras off. Okay, we don't record the session, so it is safe uh, for them to share. And we've just launched the Advanced Metastatic Breast Cancer Online Support Group because sometimes it does come back. And so they, there is a group of women that are there of which they are at this stage and they're able to share with you tips as well. The key thing here is that this 
is talking about psychosocial needs. This is not a platform for us to talk about medical conditions. This you need to talk to your doctor about. Okay, so this is a, 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 an outlet for them to share accordingly. And what uh, Dr. Benita Tan has said, yes, exercise is key. And there are different stages of exercise depending on, you know, the, the level of surgery and, and, and your healing process. So we do have a Healing Through the Arts program where we have low impact to high impact. And of course, if, if we actually try and measure according to your fitness level, but this you need to check with your doctor if you are suitable for certain um, activities. Why I say that is because we do have one which is called dragon boating. Now, this is very, very physical. And this, you really need your doctor's clearance to participate in this. And uh, our women there uh, have actually been certified by the doctor to say, yes, you can participate. But usually, um, they, we would only admit these uh, warriors in usually about seven months after the surgery. Yeah, because we, we want to make sure that, you know, you've totally, um, your tissues and muscles have healed totally. And I can tell you, we've got peddlers that are 72 years old. They'll put all of us to shame. They are super fit. So this is all about, this is where we talk about strengthening the community, building a sisterhood and, and also allowing the women to know that, hey, there is life after cancer. And actually, when they participate in this program, what we do find is that they found that the cancer journey was something that made their lives even more meaningful and more fantastic. Okay, so I just wanted to share with you just, just a couple of things of what we do. Do contact us because we also have this available, which is called Rebuilding a Positive Body Image. This is specifically targeted for those who are of the lower income group we will actually fund the um, prosthetic bras. So you just need the medical social worker to come and uh, write to us and it will be sent to the patients directly. It's available at all hospitals, okay? So as such, I mean, it's just a quick uh, run through, uh, but do contact us uh, at, through WhatsApp. Give us your feedback of how we can improve our services and how we can support the community even more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samantha. Really appreciate the work that um, all of you at BCF are doing for our patients. And, um, you know, it's, it's very meaningful and impactful as well. Um, and hopefully, you know, um, patients and members of the public can actually share what of these um, services and options that BCF is conducting, right? Um, so thank you so much for that. We have some time for a few questions. Um, I've, I've looked at the questions that were submitted at registration and also some that were coming in during the Q&A. Maybe I'll just do a bit of consolidation so that it will be easier for us to, to kind of um, go through them. We may end up um, going past 12, but um, I've actually noticed the numbers and the number of people who have actually left the webinar are almost like not no one. <laughs> so quite clearly, everyone sees that there's a lot of learning points over here. And, um, you know, it's just great to, to know that even for myself, you know, we're all learning something new today. Right, so um, maybe let's just go to some of the questions that were submitted uh, earlier. So I think one of the commonest questions that patients also tend to ask, uh, you know, I see these questions in my, my own practice is, you know, when there's a painful breast lump, um, what does it mean? Could this mean that that's cancer that's recurring? Um, and maybe you're wrong, you, you might want to take this because it's, it's actually a very common question as well. Um, not just at the point um, prior to um, any screening or diagnosis, but also later on when patients are actually under surveillance and sometimes they're concerned that pain symptoms over the, the chest or the breast um, can, could actually be related to cancer. Thank you. So uh, most breast cancers um, do not cause any symptoms if they're early. So they usually may, if they're early enough, they may not feel anything or if they present as a lump, most of the time, the cancerous lumps are painless. They just present as a lump as itself. Um, um, having said that, it's not always true. There are always there will be a minority of patients with breast cancer lumps that cause pain. Sometimes because of the breast cancer expanding quickly, press, uh, stretching the breast, or if they are growing and then compressing on other parts of the body, then they may cause pain. Um, and uh, sometimes if the tumor grows bigger and causes ulcers 
uh, you may see skin changes or it starts to bleed, either from the skin or the nipple. So those are the more advanced ones. But um, if there is pain in the breast or painful lump, it is also still worth investigating. Sometimes painful lumps could be a, could be as simple as a, a breast cyst that is expanding and and, uh, and causing pain, or it could be a little abscess or cyst that's infected, causing pain and a painful lump. Or sometimes it's also um, especially in younger women, it could be due to hormonal changes in the breast, uh, depending on the monthly cycle, causing pain and the breast appear more lumpy and you have uh, benign lumps like fibroadenomas and all that and because of the swelling of the breast you get pain at the time of the month uh, or sometimes it could also be muscular um, causes so it's, it's very hard to differentiate um, so don't, don't uh, be afraid just come and see your doctor uh, we will help you help differentiate and hopefully assure you whether it's a benign I mean not cancerous or whether it's a cancerous lump and we'll work from there but most importantly, if you do feel anything, whether it's a lump, whether there's pain or no pain, please don't sit on it. And uh, most importantly, you seek a medical advice first. You're really wrong. Um, I have another question, and maybe this you can ask um, Dr. Benita because she had covered the lymph lymphedema question. It's related to lymphedema. So who in the multidisciplinary treatment team is generally best placed to advise about you know, the appropriate strategies for lymphedema. For example, if a lymphatic, um, if the physio fails after several months of treatment, then what would be the process? Should the person go back to the surgeon or should there be a referral from the physio? And how does that process normally work out? Yeah, so, so as, I, uh, as I mentioned, I think the care of the arm in terms of lymphedema is really also multidisciplinary. Uh, the physiotherapist, in this case, uh, occupational therapy does the uh, physio work for us in Singapore the institution. They are actually baseline in their team. And if uh, that doesn't work and surgery is really to be considered, then our plastic surgeon uh, does that surgery. So for us in Singapore, we really work very closely as a team. So whether it's a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, or the breast surgeon who notice that on follow up, the patient has lymphedema. Then we have got a program going in our lymphedema work group that we will refer to the occupational therapy if they're no longer being seen by the occupational therapy uh, after surgery because all our patients will be seen by the occupational therapy and be taught basic arm care and uh, basic massage. So if that's the case, so then they, they have been lost uh, to review for a very long time and then we will basically get a new referral for OT. And then we'll again at the same time get a referral to our plastic surgeon to assess and discuss suitability for surgery intervention. Uh, but there's no replacement, there's no replacement for arm care as well as massage and uh, sometimes compression. Even if we do surgery, uh, we have shown surgery results that has improved the lymphedema, but it's always hand in hand with arm care as well as compression. So it, it, we must not get away to say that, to think that if I do surgery, I can stop all the arm care and I can stop all the compression and such. It, it comes together, it has to come together for the best results. Thank so you. Any one of us, you see, you can go back to your breast surgeon, you can go to your radiation oncologist or medical oncologist. At least in Sing Health, we work together as a big team and we can, we can direct the referral very, very easily. That's right. Thank you so much for that. Um, there was a question about when patients are on surveillance, um, how do we actually monitor for breast cancer relapse? Um, and what treatment or surveillance modalities do we use? So I think, um, you do you want to answer that question or I can help to answer that question as well, but I shouldn't. <laughs> well, we all work as a team, right, Guren? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, um, in terms of surveillance, there are a few modalities. If we go by clinical examination, so whether you have a you still have a breast left after your breast preserving surgery, or even whether it's a mastectomy, your flat chest, or the reconstruction, it's always important to examine that area to make sure no new lumps or, or changes occur. And we also always examine the other breast as well, and also in the, the lymph node areas, maybe in the armpit or the area above the shoulders just to make sure there's no local recurrence. Um, in terms of looking for any recur recurrence elsewhere in the body, um, we don't routinely do scans, but um, as per guidelines, unless there are symptoms, 
um, of course, we worry about the lung and bone and liver. So if there are any symptoms that may worry us, like loss of appetite or weight or bony pain that doesn't go away or breathlessness, you know, lung problems, uh, the, we hopefully will pick it up during our clinical consult and we will investigate accordingly. So these are some images that we do to look around the body. And for the breast, it's mainly uh, examination and yearly mammogram. Uh, plus minus ultrasound, depending on the, the individual, um, whatever, uh, uh, what was the, whether the other lumps to begin with, they need monitoring as well. Uh, we don't routinely do uh, blood tumor markers, at least not for early stage cancer. So, yeah. so that's what we do. And we, the, in terms of surveillance, usually it doesn't have to be only by the surgeon. We usually work as a team. So if the patient has also seen by oncologists or radiation oncologists, then we'll take things as a team. To see. So usually in the first couple of years after the initial surgery, the monitoring is closer, at least every three, four monthly. And as you graduate um, over the years and you're surviving longer and longer from your cancer, then our frequency of examination and visits usually be so from three to four monthly, four to six monthly, and then to yearly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Yerong. Um, maybe the final one or two questions. Um, the next one was by one of the live questions. It was about in breast cancer, when do we consider the patient to have been in remission and, you know, potentially comfortable that the cancer will not come back. And maybe I think the one good way to kind of look at this is how is breast cancer kind of different compared to, you know, other cancers in that sense. And why do we follow them up for a long time, um, despite the treatment that they receive? <laughs> Um, uh, I don't want to talk about yeah. yeah, so actually, Huren, you're the expert for this, like, too. but anyway, I will try my best to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, so across the board, I, I think we, we see it very clearly in the literature and the long-term outcomes for our ladies that actually many women survive very, very long and live without a cancer relapse, but some women do. So how do we uh, assess who are at risk of uh, getting a relapse and will not live as well? And it's really clearly dependent on when the stage of the cancer has been picked up, which is when it was picked up and when they started treatment. So clearly the higher the stage, uh, the higher the chance of relapse. And also the type of cancer as well, the, the more aggressive the biology of the cancer, then the higher, the slightly higher chance of relapse. So in terms of survival, then we really look at the first five years and then the five years after. So in broad principle, although cancers can be diagnosed at a very, very early stage, we know that even at early, early stage one, you know, it is possible to get a relapse later on in their lifetime. So, so, so un unfortunately or fortunately, uh, we cannot say that, we can say that most women will do very well, but, you know, we cannot say that, you know, the cancer will never, never come back. It can come back, but the risk is low. So in a person who has got a high stage and bad biology, then usually the risk of relapse tend to appear in the first five years. And if they don't appear in the first five years, then they are likely put of being cured from the cancer is much higher. So that's the reason why also in the first five years we monitor very closely. So for example, we have got a lady with say a stage three uh, triple negative breast cancer. And if they don't recur in the first five years, they are probably less likely to recur later on, right? But for some other tumours, for example, uh, the not so aggressive tumours, uh, some of the so-called better biology, a lot of them will not get a recurrence, but occasionally, occasionally, some of these women can have a recurrence 10, 20 years down the road, somewhere else in the body. But thankfully, these are not a very large number. But we just need to be aware that, you know, you may be well for 10 years, you may be well for 20 years. If there's something unusual, please check it out. Yeah, please check it out. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Benita. Um, there was, there are still a few more questions coming in, but maybe I would, uh, what I would like to share is that we would actually be sharing the recording of this webinar with all the attendees and also with um, Breast Cancer Foundation. So if any of you want to have a look at the content, um, you know, that will be made available. Uh, we'll send an email, we'll send an email with a link to that. Um, also, um, please ask your questions even after the webinar. If our previous webinars, we've had many people write in with more questions and we can certainly share that with our speakers today 
and have them addressed um, even after the webinar session. So even if you are not able to address them, since they're still coming in, um, we will get them addressed later on. I'll probably just want to answer one last question that was asked by, by one of the attendees. And that was, um, with so much going on, what are the newer treatments um, that may be available for patients with breast cancer in Singapore? Um, if, if I could answer that question as, you know, the, the uh, CEO and co-founder of Oncoshot, where, we, you know, we are really looking at clinical trials as well as a medical oncologist, um, maybe I would just share that with everyone. Um, today, I think what's really very remarkable is that in Singapore as um, a center, uh, we really see ourselves as evolving as a regional hub for cancer care and innovation. This amount of effort in terms of new clinical trials and therapies and strategies that are being tested. And you know, the last that I checked um, on our national landscape was that we are past 170 interventional studies, which means we were literally looking at how new treatment strategies can actually impact patients in a positive manner. And that's 170 for a population like ours just here in Singapore. Now for breast cancer patients in specific, there are many trials that are being done in the two main hospitals, um, which is the National Cancer Institute of Singapore as well as the National Cancer Center Singapore. And some of these trials are actually looking into how, as Dr. Bonita would have alluded to earlier, you know, how we can try to give treatment before surgery um, in the intent of getting a much better response on the tumor so that the outcomes for surgery can also be enhanced um, for the patients. And there are also a lot of clinical trials that are looking at new combinations of treatments um, for patients in that manner. And um, I think what's really nice is, you know, as we mentioned many times during this particular uh, webinar, um, because of very strong communication across the different teams that are involved in an individual patient's care, from the surgeons to the medical oncologists to the nursing team, um, these options are always going to be available to all our patients. Um, um, all you need to do is just, if you're not sure, just ask anyone and they should be able to guide you um, to, you know, what those options are in terms of your clinical trial options as well. Um, what I would just like to say is, um, for the patient and caregiver perspective, if you can always ask your physician, um, aside from my standard therapies, is there anything else that can be considered given that, you know, I'm receiving care in an excellent center such as yours? I think that kind of closes the loop on your true options in your landscape um, for your condition. So I think um, that was about clinical trials uh, specifically. Um, but aside from that, um, that's, today's webinar was really fascinating from the perspective of the nuances of breast cancer surgery, which to me is actually very, very exciting because even as the medical oncologist, you don't get to talk so much about it. You know, we, had, we have glimpses of it here and there, but to see how things have just changed so much from the time and even as a training in a training in medical school is all about you know a radical mastectomy or, or a Halstead mastectomy that everyone was talking to us about things have evolved so much and I think that's one of the most amazing things in this field and um, you know we hope that our patients can get even better options um, for their overall outcomes over time so I think with that I'd like to say a big thank you to all our speakers um, Dr. Sin, Dr. Tan and Samantha for spending your Saturday mornings with us. It's a precious Saturday morning, um, but you know, it's been a good turnout and our, it looks like all our attendees really enjoyed the talk as well. Um, so I look forward to kind of catching up with some of the additional questions that may come up later. And hopefully you can take this forward for our breast cancer community. So thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Okay. Thank you Have so much day. for spending the time Thanks. with us. Thank you. Bye-bye.